very, very warm today, but I pray that the Lord specifically will keep us all awake in here and be able to listen to these words, especially since our topic today is on the wisdom of words and the importance of them as we continue through our study of this book of Proverbs this summer, thinking about the timely wisdom that God gives to his people in order to live for him and to display him to a watching world. You know, uh, as I was preparing for this, I was thinking about how often we talk, and for most of us, this is the primary method of communication. We speak to each other, some on the order of several thousand words a day, perhaps less during this pandemic, But really, as you think about it, to talk is really to be human. Humans have this strong need to communicate with each other, to discuss things. I think one of the cruelest things that you can do to a person is to put them into solitary confinement where they have no one to talk to. And they have this strange sense that they need to talk to somebody. So they'll either talk to themselves or talk to the wall or whatever, but we have to talk. Now, despite how important words are and what they can do, Our society, modern North American society, is extremely casual, I would say, and imprecise and even thoughtless about the words that we speak or we sometimes post. And one of the reasons for this, I think, is actually the rise of the internet. And that is, if you think about it, in the past, the things that people primarily read were books. And when you read a book, you realized that you had to get it from like a library or from a publisher. And publishing a book was very expensive and a lengthy process. And so naturally the process would filter out junk and keep generally things which are of higher quality reading material. Today's world is completely different in that anybody can post something on their own personal blog. It doesn't cost them a cent. Or people, for example, can um, just self-publish even their own books online. So as a result of this, just the proliferation of stuff and information that's available onto the internet, I think the dietary habits of people's reading has actually changed. So a lot of people today spend 90, 95% of their time reading things like low quality blogs or clickbait articles, right, or visual learning through YouTube, or they read Instagram status posts, and that's the extent actually of your reading. There are very few actually today who pick up books and read them from cover to cover, you know, and grappling with what's in it. And I think it's actually taken its toll on us in a society. Now, there's a psychologist, developmental psychologist named Marianne Wolf, and she observed this. She said, we are not only what we read, but we are also, we are how we read. In other words, what she's saying, it's not just the words. It's not just the shallow stuff that we read online that is making us shallow, but it's the very way that we read as well on the internet. So the internet prizes a style of writing that's efficient, short, has immediacy in it, and what this has done, it's actually weakened our ability to synthesize, process, follow complex arguments, and to be able to think through things deeply. Today, most of us actually have trouble following chains of reasoning, large, Uh, you know, speeches, you know, and being able to follow one idea through another, it's just really tough now. Like, if you look at in the old days how politicians actually spoke, most people looked at them and expected people in public to be able to articulate their thoughts clearly, to be people of character, and to be also well-read. You know, for example, you look at Abraham Lincoln's famous Gettysburg Address that was only 272 words spoken in 1863. Tiny little thing has gone down in history as one of the greatest speeches of all time. Today, if you were to look at the political landscape, uh, we'd be challenged to find things of that level. For example, if you were to analyze, for example, the speech patterns of Donald Trump, the current American president, it's actually fascinating in what it reveals with regards to the massive cultural shift that has taken place. So, for example, Donald Trump, you know, uh, speaks very differently from many other politicians. And there's a linguist, Dr. Jennifer Sclafani, who noted that Trump is actually a very unique politician because he doesn't talk like one. And if you ever speak, you heard him speak, you realize this. For example, he uses very simple words that are very low reading level, often preferring words that are one or two syllables in length. And phrases, for example, he'll use that are simple grammatically, like, we will have so much winning if I get elected that you will get bored of winning. Almost all the sentences, everything in there is very, very simple. Also, he jumps from one subject to another very, very abruptly, shifting from one to the other with very little warning. Another thing that he often says is he'll say things like, believe me, believe me, believe me, right? And he'll gesture like this with both of his hands. 
And he uses this often at the front of his sentences and also at the back of his sentences. And what this actually does is that it serves to create, if you will, an emphasis, a verbal bracket around the points, simple points that he's making that he believes are important. It's kind of like the computer equivalent of typing in size like, you know, 40 font and making it all bold. That's exactly what he's doing with his words. So also another thing that he does is that he uses a lot of hyperbole, like exaggeration. For example, he'll say, we'll build the greatest wall. Something was a tremendous influence. You know, nothing is bigger. This is the best. They're fabulous people. All these words are hyperbolic, right? They go far beyond actually what things are. Now, what's fascinating about this is that many Americans who voted him in love this casual, down-to-earth, straightforward, and sometimes crass and even demeaning tone of his, and they look on it favorably. And the question is, why is that? Why such a dramatic shift? A politician like him could never have taken the office some 50 years ago. And the reason for that is because there's been a major shift in the way that common people talk. Today, we generally talk in 140 character tweets. We say things like, totally awesome, or I found the best deal, like, or this is the greatest thing you can do in your life, right? Or we rapidly jump from one subject actually to another. It's difficult to have sustained conversation, especially when you're walking sometimes with young people and talking to them. It's hard to have a conversation in which someone doesn't look down at their phone and interrupt the train of thought and then go back to conversing. So, or we cite facts without actually checking them, you know, because we saw it on some blog and all this. So, Dr. Wolf actually was right, I think. We are how we read. So, Trump's thinking and the way with words that he has actually reflects the North American mindset and the change that has taken place in the way that we, too, think and speak. In other words, what I think digital you know, entertainment and social media has done is that it has basically fed us something like cocaine, and it has caused damage actually to our brains. And we do not realize actually how severely impaired our ability is to think or to hold a sustained sort of conversation or to process complex thoughts. And that, as a result of that, we are often careless in how we speak. Like, for example, we... People today, you know, often post things online that they immediately regret afterwards when the internet goes to work on them. So, for example, you'll remember a couple years back, there was a story of a lady named Justine Sacco, who in 2013 boarded a plane to go to South Africa. And before she went, she posted this tweet, going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS, just kidding, I'm white. When she got off the plane a number of hours later, she discovered to her horror that she had gone viral on Twitter and that the whole world basically knew who she was and also her phone told her that she had lost her job. See, a few hours can do that to you now with the internet, a simple, careless thing that you post out there on the public. See, in North America, we believe that freedom of speech is perhaps one of the highest principles that we need to hold to in our society. Therefore, when we talk, our default thinking with regards to speech is that speech is primarily about me. It's about me expressing myself, making my opinion known, and communicating what I am and trying to process what's going inside of me. And secondarily, do we think about the effect of speech on other people? Now, I do think that having free speech in a society is very, very important because I think having a society that can use words to deal with its conflict is better than a society in which you have to resort to weapons to deal with your conflict. However, if we want to look at this from a biblical perspective, I would say this. The Bible does not advocate so much for free speech as it does actually for wise speech. And whether that's verbal or in emails or things that you post online or things that you say on the phone, the point is the Bible is, is concerned that your speech above all else is godly and bears the wisdom of God. So what I'd like to do for us today as we go through the scriptures is I'd like to look at five things, five things I think that we can learn about from Proverbs about the importance of words, okay? Number one, wise words are beautiful, rare, and they're priceless. Now, most of us, for what we speak every single day, is really not that important after all. But people who have wisdom, that is godly wisdom, and are recognized to have this, are often sought out by others. 
Even worldly wisdom, you know, people look for and they value it so much that they're willing to pay thousands, sometimes tens of thousand dollars to have a great speaker come and address a large crowd and share basically their pearls of wisdom. You know, the Bible actually acknowledges this, the incredible richness and the, and the incredible value that words actually have. For example, if you look at Proverbs 25, verses 11 to 12, it reads this way. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. Proverbs 20, verse 15 adds to this actually by saying, There is gold and abundance of costly stones, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. Now, most of us sort of understand this intuitively. Like when we attend special events like a wedding or a graduation or uh, like a funeral, we understand that you have to change your speech. You can't speak the way that you normally do. And we use speech that fits the occasion. Beautiful words, words that are appropriate. I actually often see this as a pastor when I go to funerals. You know, I remember once giving a funeral message for a little girl. And on that particular day, the sky was really dark, it was stormy, and there were little raindrops that were falling down out of the sky in a small sort of pitter-patter, and there was a cold wind that was blowing and just kind of whipping everybody in the face. You know, as we stood there on the wet grass and we were just looking at the little casket, um, I, I looked myself at the sad faces of the family members who were all gathered around there and watching the rain drip down, and I realized it just almost felt like to me that God himself, you know, was especially close, almost as if heaven was crying tears, you know, in, in compassion and sympathy for the pain that people were feeling, especially the parents at that time. You know, I, as I was uh, preparing, I prayed for God's strength to be able to speak and to uh, address people, and so uh, I, I got up and I, I preached while everyone huddled together and tried to avoid the weather. I preached about Jesus and him being the resurrection and the life, I preached on the beauties, actually, of the new heavens and the new earth. I preached about the streets of gold in Jerusalem. I preached about the crystal clear waters of the river of life. I preached about the everlasting rest of the saints and how the people there are never unhappy and that they are ageless for all eternity. I preached about the presence of Jesus and what it's like to see our Lord and our Savior. And I preached also about the little girl lying there in the casket. And I reminded everyone that one day Jesus would also come back and he would say to that little girl, like he did in the New Testament, Talita kumi, and that little girl's body will one day rise from the dead and her parents will be able to embrace her and hold her in their arms, never again to be separated. I remember that day very clearly, just preaching my heart out, actually, to these people who were uh, in pain. I remember at the end of that, um, there was a lot of sniffling, a lot of tears, you know, but, but just uh, smiles as well of joy as people grieved but yet had such hope in their Lord and their Savior. I mean, there was a young man afterwards who was sniffling, came up to thank me, and he said, honestly, nothing that you said was new. He said it was all in the Bible, but he said it was just so beautifully put together that it gave me hope. As I was leaving, actually, that funeral, I was stopped by the funeral director of that home. And he pulled me aside and he said he wanted to speak to me privately. And he said that he had stood actually at the graveside burials of hundreds and hundreds of different uh, funerals. He'd been in the business for a long time. And he said he had never heard a message like that before that, gave, that was so beautiful and had so much hope. And he asked me, could, he, could I please have a copy of this because he wanted to read it over again to himself. So um, I did actually give him a copy of it. And I was just struck at that moment uh, about how amazing it is to think that God's word spoken at the right time, nothing clever of my own, but simply the beauty of God's word would speak to a man who has seen death a thousand times over and has not been moved by anything but would to be moved by this. And, you know, I'm looking at that, I was saying, like, please, God, I pray that this man one day uh, would come to know Jesus Christ and that this would be part and parcel of bringing him there to see the truth of God's word. You know, you see, words are extremely powerful. And we understand this, I think, at a deep sort of gut level. And we know that words are not just beautiful, but the effect that they have on people can be very significant as well. You know, there's a Roy Williams, who's an NCAA, NCAA coach, uh, once said these words, words start wars and end them. Create love, choke it. Bring us laughter and joy and tears. Words cause men and women to willingly risk their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Our world, as we know it, revolves on the power of words. This is not hard to understand. 
And actually, I would say this is why we actually groan at bad jokes or lame jokes that use words in a very unsophisticated way. You know, I actually once worked when I was an engineer in the office with a friend who had this habit of loving to tell really lame jokes. He'd do things like he'd come out of nowhere to your cubicle while you're hard at work, and he would say things like, hey, do you want to hear a joke? And we'd be like, no, go away. And then he would say things like, um, do you know how the picture ended up in jail? And he would say, it was framed in this deadpan, serious voice, and then he would just walk away. And you'd hear people groaning in the office, like, oh, just please, like, stop, like, don't, don't do this anymore, right? You know, and so he just chuckled himself, and then he'd walk off. Sometimes he'd actually give you no opportunity to brace yourself for this. He would just come up and deliver, like, a one-liner. And he would look over your cubicle, and he would say, hey, I'm reading a book on anti-gravity, and it's impossible to put down. Ha, ha, ha. And then he'd walk off. You know, and you're just like, no, that this, is, this is painful, actually, to listen to. Like, would you just stop? Day after day, things like this would go on. Now, if you think about it, you know, I... You, you wonder, why, like, why, does it, why does it do that, actually, to you? I actually went to him, and I asked him once in his office, and I said, hey, why do you do this? Why, why, do you, why do you take such pleasure in going around telling these lame jokes to people? And he says, lame jokes are very powerful because it's the way to attack the mind of a person without giving them the ability to defend themselves. And I thought about it. I'm like, yeah, he's so true because you can't unhear things like that. There's no defense, actually. There's no suit of armor in the world, no mental preparation that you can make can actually defend you from this thing. And the question is, why does a lame joke assault us this way and make us feel like, oh, that's awful, like just stop talking right now? The reason why is because the punchline of a lame joke is not something clever, but actually something that involves substituting another word that means something completely different, to give you an answer that you couldn't ever have thought about by following what sort of the, the, the phrase or the sentence means. And it feels ridiculous to us and grown worthy is because we have this expectation of something clever that's going to happen, a cultural norm that's going to be violated, and you're like, oh, you couldn't mean that. That's actually how a joke functions. And instead, there's this huge letdown in that your IQ seems to drop like 50 points, and you realize the solution to this is wholly unsophisticated in the way that it uses words. And so you feel, you know, this sense. That's why you groan at this. It seems like an abuse of the English language. See, the famous writer from the 18th century, Samuel Johnson, said this, actually, about uh, words and, and language. To trifle with the vocabulary, which is the vehicle of social intercourse, is to tamper, he says, with the cor currency of human intelligence. In other words, that's why puns are so awful is that they tamper with human intelligence, is that it has so little in them. That's why these witless things make us groan and it feels painful to us. But as funny as that may be in the realm of jokes, actually, I need to ask us a more serious question in line with what we have been talking about when it comes to wisdom. The question is, is our ordinary speech that we have with each other, with people around us, unintelligent? Is it unwise? Is it witless? Do the words that we say to other people have the effect almost of a lame joke? Is it cringeworthy? Does our talk give life to people, or does it make them groan? Or do people just pass it by and say, please, I just wish you would stop talking? Your jokes are bad enough, but what you have to say normally is awful. See, the question is, when people look at you, do they see speech that is full of beautiful, godly wisdom that offers to people relief and help in a circumstance and a time in which they need it absolutely the most. And this brings me to my second point about the function of words and why they're important. Number two, wise words heal, encourage, and give life. Okay? Proverbs 15 verse 4 says this, A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Proverbs 12, 18 follows up and says, There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Now, this is not an exaggeration in the scriptures here. I think thoughtless words can actually really harm people. You know, there's that old English saying that we say, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. The truth of that is that's, that's not true at all. In fact, words can severely wound you and even kill you, I would say. That's actually why we call some words to be 
cutting remarks because people understand that it cuts deep beneath your skin into the center and core of who you are, a place where weapons can't reach. Also, after you dish out words like that, you actually can't take them back. In the same way, like if you try to pull a sword out of someone, things aren't better. You leave a gaping wound actually there, which takes time to heal, and sometimes it leaves a scar. And that's exactly what the Proverbs writer is saying about words. Using words irresponsibly is like stabbing someone. Even after you take it out or you ask for forgiveness, it might actually leave a wound there that will not heal or leaves a scar. So it's difficult to understand. See, words can actually lead to death. You know, I read about Vince Foster, who was an American lawyer uh, serving under Bill Clinton, you know, a few decades ago. And uh, there was an ethical scandal which he became embroiled in, and he became so depressed from that scandal and the words that people were using to tear him apart that he ended up committing suicide. And he wrote in his suicide note that here in America, he said, here ruining people is considered a sport. In other words, there is a cavalierness about the way that we use words, and we love using words in our society to rip other people down. That's why reality TV sells so well, because everyone has this sense of like, oh, it's so good to see people get their just desserts. You know, these people receive words of harsh critique, and the media makes money off of this. I honestly suspect that there are more churches in the world that are destroyed as a result of poor use of words as members fight with each other than there are churches that are destroyed because a pastor committed adultery. I think poor use of words, unwise words, kills a lot of churches and destroys people. You know, in our home, the Chua household, we don't allow our children just to throw tantrums or to use harsh words with each other. And when we see things like that, we actually tell them that you need to calm down right now. We do not do this in our home, and everybody needs to take a time out, step back from each other, and only when you are calm can you come back and speak the things that you feel that you need to speak, only when the moment of anger has passed. And this is really important, I would say, because those of you who are parents today, I would say you have to teach your children to be wise now with their words and to be measured and careful with what they say. And the reason why we do this is because I think it's to save our children actually from being future character assassins, killers of people. I love what Ray Ortland uh, wrote in his book actually about Proverbs concerning this. He said, but if you do not teach your children to behave respectfully, then you are teaching your child to behave disrespectfully and to become a killer with his or her rash words. What you permit, you promote. And when your child, many years from now, splits a church by his or her sword thrust words, God will hold you in part responsible. I think he's absolutely right, actually, with this. It's essential that we not only train ourselves, but our children as well, to speak words of wisdom that bring healing to people and life and not words of anger that bring destruction and death in their wake. In fact, the Bible talks to us and says that wise words can actually even save the lives of the defenseless. Proverbs 31, verses 8 to 9 says this, Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. See, in other words, what the Proverbs is saying is that we have an obligation to fight for those who have no words of their own. When we don't speak up for the oppressed, we actually support sin in our silence or our lack of words. You can sin with your words, and you can also sin by not using your words. See, God sees, says that everything that we say or we don't say is ultimately before Him. And every single idle word or every careless word we speak one day will brought, be brought into an account. So important that we learn to be a people who are wise with our words and bring healing with our words. Number three, wise words solve conflicts and communicate love. Proverbs 15 verse 1 says this, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Like, we all know this, but we understand that wise words are hard to speak, especially when we're in heated situations, right? When people are harsh towards us, we want to lash out, take it out on them in return. But the Bible says here that soft words can actually put out the hot fires that are stoked by anger. In fact, some of the greatest medicine, the best medicine that any husband can give to his wife when there is anger, 
you know, in the home, is to say the words like, I'm sorry, and actually mean that. Be the first one to acknowledge your own part in the midst of your conflict. You know, as Christians, God actually calls us to reconcile broken relationships with one another in Matthew chapter 18, to put out the fires of anger and to be reunited with each other. Go and talk to your brother and sister. You know, our world has a very different perspective when it comes to reconciliation. The world says, when you've had enough, just forget that person and let people who are silly be silly and go off and do your own thing. That's not an option for us in the Christian church as we are actually called to love. You know, in his book, uh, Francis Schaeffer's book, The Mark of the Christian, Schaeffer said this about love and the importance of words when we're in conflict. He said, if I'm not willing to say I'm sorry when I have wronged somebody else, especially when I have not loved him, I have not even started to think about the meaning of a Christian oneness which the world can see. The world has a right to question whether I'm a Christian and more than that, if I am not willing to do this very simple thing, the world has a right to question whether Jesus was sent from God and whether Christianity is true. In other words, what he's saying is that when you fail to follow Christ's commands and you live however you want while calling yourself a Christian, not using your words to solve conflicts but to bring destruction in your wake, people actually will question whether or not Christianity is real. You talk about how great it is like this, but I see no effect on your life. Why would I want to be a Christian? In other words, the word of God is blasphemed amongst the Gentiles because of you. See, the stakes are very, very high. Gospel witness is at stake by the way we use our words. So the next time you're tempted to be harsh or to argue and to use words that rip down, I want you to remember a few Proverbs, like Proverbs 19, verse 11, that says, Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. So in other words, you, you take a deep breath when you're in conflict and say, okay, Jesus, you were slandered as well. You did not open your mouth, but you went as a sheep to a slaughter because you did not repay the Roman soldiers and the Jews who were persecuting you and killing them. You could go to the cross and die for me so that I could be a recipient of grace. It's because you did not take justice into your own hands and retaliate that I have life. So help me now as well, God, please, to not retaliate with my mouth, but give an opportunity for people to seek grace and hopefully lead them to life with my Savior. That's what we need to think and say, God, help me to believe this as actually my glory to overlook an offense as I become an agent of grace and reconciliation leading people to Christ and not just an agent expressing my own need to have justice and have a favorable circumstance in my own life. Before the battle starts, I would say, think about your tongue and remember Proverbs 17, 14 that says this, the beginning of strife is like letting out water so quit before the quarrel breaks out. In other words, what the Proverbs here is saying that, you know what's easier than cleaning up water after there's been a flood? Start by going to the dam and making sure the dam doesn't break in the first place. That's way easier, and remember that. So be careful, actually, with your words before there's a flood that you have to clean up and undo the damage of. Now, just to be clear, this doesn't mean that reconciliation is just a simple thing. That's like, I'm just going to say sorry, and then we forget about it and hope let bygones be bygones. No, that's not what I'm suggesting. In fact, I do think that true reconciliation involves you having to have a very honest conversation, not mincing with words, uh, but being calm about the conflicts that you've had in a, con in a constructive and non-destructive way. Like, and if you can't solve it between each other, do what Matthew 18 says and say, we can't see eye to eye on this. I need another brother or sister to come in here and to help us be able to see each other's perspective and to be able to see what is right or what is wrong here. And if I'm wrong, I want to be able to change and be more like Christ-like, and I hope that you would as well. In other words, we are called to do this. Now, I know in our world today, uh, you know, many people like you know, get so angry with each other over text messages or they send emails to each other or they try to work on these things. I would just say to you, for those of you who are digital um, users, I would say, don't do this over email, okay? Don't text people. Don't try to solve things over WhatsApp like this. Don't do it Instagram, you know, status posts, like snapping at each other. Don't, don't do this way. 
honestly, I think email is one of the worst things to use when it comes to trying to work things out with people. And the reason why is that email is a one-way communication street. And all it does is actually allows you to vent without giving another person an opportunity to defend themselves or even to help you see their perspective or to show you where you're wrong. Monologuing does not allow you to reconcile. So if that's you, I would say don't, don't, don't do this to a brother or sister. Go and meet them face to face with genuine love in your heart and say, let's work this out together as we talk to each other in this way. See, the goal of this is not to win. Don't forget that. The goal is to win your brother or sister with words so that you two might be together again. See, to be honest and calm, actually, with each other, to do this, to reconcile, is actually a huge act of love. Like Proverbs 24, verse 26 says this, Whoever gives an honest answer kisses the lips. In other words, don't hide the truth. Speak the truth in love to one another, and it will communicate the same to them as you are honest with people, even though it's painful, as a kiss on the lips would be. Now, it would be highly inappropriate for us to go around simply kissing each other, but the point is well taken here. The point is that there's a level of intimacy and equalness between two people who kiss each other and acknowledge each other, and it communicates care for the other person. And the Proverbs is saying here, you don't have to be that intimate with each other to actually love another person. You can do this as well with an honest answer. And honestly, when you go and you talk to a person, and they see you here being very calm, speaking painful things to them in truth, I think they're forced to grapple with that and consider and say, hmm, you're telling me this not because you're trying to destroy me in this moment. I know this is really, really hard for you. The only reason you're doing this is obviously because you do care for me. And many times, people respond well to this in love, and they're willing to say, okay, maybe, maybe you do actually have a point there. Thank you for bringing this up to me. An honest answer really is a kiss on the lips. See, never underestimate the power of words especially soft words when a situation is heated. Proverbs 25, verse 15 says this, With patience, a ruler may be persuaded, and a soft tongue will break a bone. I love this proverb, actually, because it teaches us here that soft words really are amongst the most powerful weapons in the world. So if you want to change the unyielding mind of a friend or a person who is in a high place, Pick the best weapon to use against them and go soft. That's what the Proverbs is actually saying here. Fourth thing that I want to point out, number four. Wise words feed others. Proverbs 10.21 says this. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for a lack of sense. Now, remember how I said at the beginning of this that in North America, we think about speech as primarily being about expressing ourselves, communicating our own opinions and our thoughts, getting things off of our chest? See, in this Bible verse, we actually learn the opposite here, that speech actually isn't primarily about us, but actually about others. In fact, it says here that wise words actually feed other people. Paul picks up on this idea, actually, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, where he says this, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, that it may give grace to those who hear. See, in other words, what he's saying is that Christians are to be people who dispense grace with our mouths to all people around us with wise words, not just on Sunday when you're all gathered here, but also at all times when you're going about your daily business in the world. See, you ever realize that when people talk to you and you talk back to them, that you're actually preparing a buffet for them with your words that will either feed them with wisdom that will be healing and life-giving to their soul, or it will actually be giving them empty calories or junk food that's worthless to them, or even in worst cases, you might be feeding them poison. Every time you talk, you are feeding people with something. And the question is, what is that something? See, that's why wise words are so important. Proverbs 12, verse 25 says this, Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. In other words, what God's saying is acknowledging this feeding fact that uh, our spiritual health, 
Our nutrition is actually dependent on other people as well. It's dependent on words coming to us from the outside. And I think many of us actually know this as well intuitively. Like if you go around telling yourself, I'm smart, I'm great, I am the best, but you're the only one who says that about yourself, and everybody looks at you and says, mm, nope, you're not. It doesn't matter who you are. You won't be able to kid yourself, actually, for very long. You will know deep down inside that you really are not smart. You really are not the best. But if somebody else, especially somebody else who respects you or somebody else who is well-respected in the community comes up and says to you, you're the most brilliant person that I've ever met. Now, that means something. Why? Because it's actually coming from the outside, from somebody who's looking at it and saying, okay, I really do look at you and I think I see you this way. And if they say that to you, you'll actually be encouraged. And the same thing happens to us when it comes to Christian words. That's why we're commanded actually to encourage each other, to speak words that are gracious to each other. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his famous book, Life Together, says this about Christian encouragement. The Christian needs another Christian who speaks God's word to him. The Christ in his own heart is weaker than the Christ in the word of his brother. His own heart is uncertain. His brother's is sure. Now, he's talking about times in which you're just so depressed, you know, and you find yourself in a hole and you can't really get out of it. And the way that God has created you and the church to function is to allow grace to be administered to you from the outside through the mouth of some other believer who loves you and cares for you. See, sometimes the solution really to our heart's troubles is somebody else speaking to you and reminding you of what's actually true. Now, we shouldn't take this to mean that when I feel down and discouraged and life is not going very well, the problem lies with brothers and sisters all the time and that they're sinning and not coming up to encourage me. No, no, no. We, we, we can't be that simplistic about this. There's a personal responsibility on our part as well as we think about our own sin in the matter as well. So like when things go wrong. Like I read this week also a fascinating article by Healthline that was vetted by Dr. Tim Legg, who is a licensed psychologist that talked about he, was, he says is the danger of what is called a victim mentality. And the characteristics of this, he said, this kind of thinking are this. Bad things, number one, bad things happen and will keep happening. Two, other people or circumstances are to blame. Three, any efforts to create change will fail, so there's no point in trying. And many people actually get trapped in this kind of thinking. Now, the article goes on to note that this thinking is actually dangerous, and it can actually lead oftentimes to people actually avoiding personal responsibility on their part for the things that are in their own life that need to change, but they actually don't want to change. Now, if you are a Christian, that the Bible actually has a response to each, three, each of these three things. Firstly, the Bible says, basically, if God is our Father, He means well to us. And even though it's painful um, in life, he does work out all things for good in our lives. So we cannot believe the fact that only bad things happen to me. Secondly, when we think that only other people and their circumstances are to blame, the Bible acknowledges the fact that, yes, other people can sometimes sin against us, and through no fault of our own, we suffer. But the Bible also says that all of us are guilty of our own sin and also blaming God and not trusting Him in our situation and our circumstances. So we need to deal with both, not just focus on other people's sin against us, but we must, as Christians, look at the sin in our own heart as well. The third thing the Bible addresses is when we think that any efforts to create change will ultimately fail, so there's no point in trying, we have to be able to say, is that actually true? Or is that a lie of the evil one? And the Bible tells us that through the Holy Spirit, we have the ability to kill sin and put it to death in our lives. And if we do so, according to the book of Romans, we will actually live. So in other words, when we say it's always going to be like this and any efforts to make change are going to fail, what we're saying is that God is a failure. God will not make good on his work, and my ultimate problem is with God. See, a secular world does not have an, a strong ability to deal with these three things. But I think as Christians, we can actually deal with them very well because the, it goes all the way back to, can we believe what God has to say about himself? See, if you don't realize that you have a responsibility to fight the lies of this world or the lies that Satan gives to us with biblical truth and wisdom, if we don't realize that we actually have to fight to do this, what will happen in your life is that you will actually fail to feed others with your words. And instead, what you will do with your words is that you'll become an individual who vents to other people and you will suck the life actually out of them. In fact, you're not actually loving your brother and sisters with your speech. 
and nourishing them with the biblical wisdom that God commands all of us to diligently seek out and to give to our brothers and sisters around us. See, if you do this consistently, and you're actually only happy when you can vent to others, but you're angry when other people actually are not there to listen to you, and you only have God to talk to, you're actually committing idolatry in your heart. You are substituting a creature for the Creator. You know what an idol actually is? An idol is something that makes you happy when you have it, and when you don't have it, you're absolutely broken and destroyed without it. You want to know what the idols are in your life? Just find out the things that you need to take away from you, and you sink into a, a, a despair and a mire that you feel God even can't help you out of it. If that's you, you have an idol. How important words are for you to be able to hear me. So what I was saying about idols here is that if in fact you make another person your idol, don't kid yourself into thinking that you actually love them. You don't love them. You're actually using them instead. And if you use someone, you can't be showing them grace or truly loving them. See, I don't want to make a life light of depression or deep problems in life sometimes that feel absolutely horrible, and, 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 and I want to acknowledge how crippling it can be. But at the same time, there is no problem, no depression, and no thing that is too deep for the grace of God to be able to deal with. He is a God of infinite power and strength and can help anybody who comes to him, even a thief on the cross who wants to repent for, their sin, for his sin. See, the question for us is, did you ever realize that the words that you have in your mouth have the power either to drain other people or to nourish them? Do you ever think about the way that you use your words with other people? Or as a North American, do you, have you bought into the cultural narrative that your speech is all about you, expressing who you are, your opinions, how you feel? See, when you call others, do you always talk about yourself or do you talk about them? See, church, we're called, according to the scriptures, to feed other people with our words. This brings me to my fifth point here. Wise words feed you too. Proverbs 18, verses 20 to 21 says this. From the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach is satisfied. He is satisfied by the yield of his lips. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat its fruit fruit. I love this text because it's fascinating. It basically says, look, the fruits of grace from your own mouth will come back actually to feed you. And you actually see this all the time. You speak graciously to other people. Many things in life occur this way. You will find that grace is given back to you. Like a number of you know that this week that my wife actually has not been well, uh, and it's not COVID-19 related. And we actually have been blessed to have a huge outpouring of love from people in our church, whether it's meals, you know, or people watching our kids, or just words of encouragement, or people saying, we are absolutely praying for you, and we pray for you every single day. You know, I thought about it, and I realized I, I like to think that the kindness that we receive is because many of you see us as a blessing in this church and want to return that blessing by being kind to us as well. And for that, we're, we're, super, we're super grateful not just because I occupy this job position of a title and that people feel obligated to help us. I would like to think it's because of the grace that flows in a circle here of love in this church. You know, for me to feed people, like all of you sitting here, those of you that I'm looking at here through the camera and the fellowship hall and those of you who are online as well, you know, to feed all of you the precious word of God in the things that I prepare and I labor over every single week or in my phone conversations with you during the week or meetings that we have is a great privilege. To think that every single day that God gives me life, I have the opportunity to take the word of God through my mouth and apply it to people's lives and to watch them grow strong spiritually and to be nourished inside of their bodies. And to think that the nourishment that people have in this church in their spiritually strong and healthy state comes back around to me and to my family to nourish us, whether it's physically or spiritually, in return is an incredible thing. We live, actually, this proverb. I see it even today in my own life. You want to know how a healthy church functions? 
It's a church actually full of people who are so concerned about feeding each other that the whole community actually gets fed. That's the power actually of words. Good, wise words actually don't just feed yourself. They actually feed others, right? But don't think that you won't be fed. You will be fed in return. You know, it's really that you reap what you sow. I know it seems kind of counterintuitive in this world, you know, that says, what, you mean that you give and you give and you get and somehow you get fed? Yes, I think that's what the Bible teaches. Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And we understand this. You want to be full? Feed other people, and you will find that your stomach is actually never empty. You know, I think it's fascinating that in this verse here that it says that death and life are actually in the power of the tongue. It's so significant, actually, because death and life are almost always invariably in the scriptures associated with God himself. And here, the Proverbs actually says, no, death and life is in the power of your tongue. Now, I don't think he's saying that, uh, you know, you're the master of God or any sense, but I think what God is saying here is saying, you understand how immensely powerful your words are? The way that I've made the world is this, is that if you use your tongue to actually feed other people, they will have life. But if you use your tongue to rip down other people, tear them apart, or to poison them, you will actually find death. And the choice actually is yours and has everything to do with how you use your mouth. God's death and life is mediated in this world in one way, through our mouths. See, words absolutely matter. You know, friends, as we, as we wrap this up, I just want to ask us here, have you ever thought about this? Are you actually wise with your words? Do you realize that everything that you say, everything that you post online, the way that you carry yourself in public or here in the church is, is a buffet before other people and can either feed them nutrition or suck the life out of them? Are you, with your mouth, a verbal soup kitchen that feeds people from all backgrounds with life-nourishing soup? Or are you a one-star restaurant that every time you open your mouth, people run away from and a place that you wouldn't want to send your worst enemy to eat at. What are you? You're always feeding. The question is, what are you feeding? What are you doing with your mouth? Like, I know this can be tough, you know, for us to do. Some people are harder to work with than others. But the, the real question here is, Jesus point, God points out, you want, to feed, you want to feel full in your life, feed other people. See, communication is at the core of who we are because we're all made in God's image. And God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has always been communicating, speaking in himself, talking, you know, and finding infinite joy. And so we also are dependent on God actually to speak to us, to give us joy from the outside. And I would say the greatest joy that we can receive, the greatest word that's spoken to our heart is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, we know from the scriptures that Jesus is the very word of God, the exact imprint of his nature. Because Jesus did not answer back, to the Pharisees and to the Jews and went to the cross on our behalf, the wisdom of God allowed for him to be crucified. And as a result of his words and God, him speaking from the cross, it is finished. You and I now are saved, having the blood of Jesus Christ applied to our souls. Because of the word of God, you and I are born again to a living hope, a living hope that goes into heaven one day and will be secure for all eternity. Because the word of God that is spoken to us, you and I have security. As the Bible tells us, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. See, words, our power, our words are powerful, especially God's word. A word that is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, pierces down to the core of who we are and ultimately secures our salvation. Right? As the Bible says, faith comes by hearing, and this is the word of God. See, words are the difference between life and death. And that is why we love the gospel of Jesus Christ so much. It's the greatest word that we can give anyone. It's the word that we live by and the word that saves our soul and the only hope for a world that is dying. So my exhortation to all of us and my question for us, brothers and sisters, is this. Will you be wise with your words? And through your words, will you point people to the ultimate hope that they can find in the true word of God, Jesus Christ Christ? who says that his sheep will hear his voice and hear his words, and that there are many who don't yet belong to his fold that he wants to save. And as you go out and be an agent of blessing with your words, may God give you the privilege of seeing people come to know the true and living word and to experience the resurrection life through the power of his words. Let's pray.
Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for loving us and for providing us, God, with these words of life. I pray, Father, that you would help us feed other people and not be destroyers with our words. Help us to be like Jesus, O oh God, who used his words well, O oh God, and fed thousands. I know, O oh God, he gave out bread, but he himself was the true bread of life. And as he spoke, O oh God, his words, O oh God, gave eternal life to all who would come to him. So, Father, I pray, O oh God, would you help us be wise with our words and with our words point people to the ultimate word, the true word of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us, O oh God, not to live in fear or in timidity or in depression, but, O oh God, fight for and cling to your promises. We praise you and we thank you, O oh God, for this word in Jesus' name. Amen.